Executive Dean of the Great Campus of Southwestern Oregon Community College. Oh, did I start too quickly for you there, Carl? Oh, that's fine. No. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, yeah. Kelly is trying to rattle me here. Shelly or Kelly or whoever she is. Okay, so um, this is our inaugural uh, speaking event. We're pleased that Kelly was able to uh, accept the uh, invitation, the honor. Well, he, he will decide. I mean, you'll decide if it's an honor. But we're, we're really pleased to have Kelly here. She is the Lower Rogue Watershed Council Coordinator. And uh, I think we're really on, uh, on the same beat because I, I suggested the title and she actually liked it. So um, we have a few flyers out there. We will have these on a weekly basis. Next week, Al Cullinette will be here to talk about hiking in our area. And he will kick off some hikes each month. So if you're interested in that, we'd invite you to uh, grab a flyer or take one here. And as the program goes on, if you would like to fill out our little um, satisfaction survey, then we would invite you to do so. You don't have to, uh, even though the lady at the back table will try to get you to do so. All right, we do have drinks and uh, peanuts, mixed nuts, if you'd like. So without any further ado, I'm going to turn it over to, to Kelly. Thank you for being here. Thank you, Doug. Uh, I think we could be a good, I always have trouble with titles, so I think this could work out. I might be calling, calling Doug in the future. Um, as you said, I'm Kelly Timchak. I am the coordinator of the Lower Rogue Watershed Council. That's over in Gold Beach. Um, just to hop and a skip down the road here. Pretty informal presentation, so feel free. Totally happy with you guys asking questions in the middle or if something pops in your head, go for it. Because it's easier than trying to remember it until the end and then it's out of context. So I would say go ahead and ask me whatever you need in the middle. I'll see if I can answer it. If I won't, I'm going to be honest about it. So that's where we're at. Or if you need a drink of water or anything in the middle, feel free. You're not going to throw me off too much. <laughs> so Doug's beautiful title is A Helpful Rogue, Lessons from the Past, Looking Toward the Future. Sounds a lot more epic than I think probably the presentation will be, but I'm going to get there. Okay, so first of all, I think you would be remiss to say anything about the Rogue River at all without acknowledging the ancestors that were here before us. Um, the Athabascan people have been here for thousands of years. There's lots of Native American tribes that thrive in the Rogue River area. This is actually a really cool map. If anybody wants any of these pictures or maps or anything after the, the presentation tonight, just let me know with an email and I can get you this information. So. Really cool stuff. This is a Curry County map from um, 1854, actually. It was from the Indian agent uh, who worked at a Port Orford. His name was J.L. Parrish, and he drew this map up um, sort of according to which tribes were sort of in a mass quantity around in which areas. So there's a few on here. Obviously, this is probably still very broad brush for who actually lives in these communities. Uh, this is Mary Bradford over here on the left. She's a Rogue River Indian. I'm not sure who the gal on the right is, um, but it is from the museum in Full Beach. Um, let's see. Okay. And this one is a really cool one, and I wanted to include it too because this is a hand-drawn map by a Rogue River uh, Native woman as well, and this is just specific to the Rogue. So you just saw the map that was whole Curry County and each of those tribes, and this is just the Rogue River specifically. So this is sort of the miles coming up the Rogue River here. And this is continuing on up. And what she described is that each of these is a different um, band or a different family, <coughs> excuse me, of the same tribes, but they all spread out just like we do. So she was actually documenting the different families that live along the river, which is really cool. So everything's going on in the 1800s. We come, white people come. Uh, towards the end of the 1800s and start settling in and moving around, moving people around. Um, and again, another person that you'd be probably hard not to mention is Artie Hume. Uh, he's sort of famously known as the Salmon King of Oregon. Um, and he got that name basically because he controlled the salmon fishing on the Lower Rogue River for about 32 years. He bought exclusive access to the lower 12 miles of the Rogue River and all the tidal lands um, within that so that's about to like Lobster Creek, right on there, if you know where that's out on the Rogue River. 
And so in 1877, he purchased all that area, and then he ended up building a cannery there, several canneries, and then he also developed the entire town of Wedderburn, which is right across the river from Gold Beach. Um, there was post office and racetracks and hotels and shopping center. I mean, he, he really built up the entire town of Wedderburn, and it's not much now. Gold Beach is the, the bigger one now. So was Gold Beach didn't exist? It was there, oh, okay. yeah, Ellensburg. Okay. Um, it was there, so it was. It was just um, he sort of developed the other side, yeah. And he did bring obviously his money and his talents. He was a politician. Uh, he actually served in legislature in the Oregon State as an Oregon State Senate for a while. Didn't really do much there, um, and uh, had a few other stents, businessman, that sort of thing. He was married, had two children uh, before he moved here. His uh, first child died, and then his four-year-old died, and then his wife died, and then he moved to Gold Beach, remarried Mary D. Hume, who is the boat that's in Gold Beach now, that, that's in our estuary, the rotting vessel, that's <laughs> named after his second wife. So regardless, he made all these great efforts to you know, bring all these eggs, collect all these eggs, collect, collect all the fish, do all the fish rearing, um, to keep the sort of factory going in the Rogue River, and he even went to the extent of uh, contacting Elk Creek, which is about 150 miles up the road, to collect eggs for him as well. The United States government paid all the workers that worked in that farm to collect those eggs and bring them down to Gold Beach. Um, so, but basically, we still saw salmon populations declining over time. That's not just because of R.D. Hume, but it just shows how one sector, you know, you can kind of abuse the situation and you, and you won't really see the recovery because it was at such a high level. Um, so ended up, he died in the early 1900s, 1908, and then a little while later, the state actually closed the river to commercial fishing. Fishing. So that was back when you could net in the river, you know, just like picking up fish. So that sucked. There was a writer from uh, 2000, Jim Likitowicz, which some of you might be familiar with. He wrote that uh, Artie Hume was a keen observer of the salmon's natural history, although he did not always interpret his observations correctly. So. You may do what you want with that. He um, definitely was an entrepreneur in the area. So I said I would show some cool photos of the road tonight. This is probably one of my all-time favorite pictures of the road. Uh, the Lee Patterson Bridge, which is still here today, that was built in 1932. This is 1939 photo, so it's pretty close after they built the bridge. They used to take a ferry um, just upstream before the bridge was taken. But if you can think about the way the Rogue is now, this is just amazing. It's got a massive lagoon down here. This is a huge area for salmon rearing, for marine species that come in and use this area. You know, there's starry flounders and sturgeon and lamprey and everything. It's a very um, vital area. <clears throat> and then you can see the tiny little mouth on such a big river. And that river actually used to bar up and close occasionally in the summer as well, just like all of our other coastal streams. Even though it's a massive system, it still had the ability to do that because those giant sandbars would fill over and fill it in before it would blow its, blow its mouth. <laughs> and you'll see that you know these, there's still remnants of these bars are here today still. These are sort of some last minute throw-ins. I just was, I had only the 1939 photo in at first because I'm gonna get to some more pictures later. But then I thought, just as reference, that it's kind of interesting to look between 1939 and this is in, I think like the 50s. I don't have an exact date on this one. Um, but it's after the jetties were built, but there is no boat basin developed yet. Um, there's no jetties coming out through here. This is at a higher tide, the time that's on the timestamp, and so you can, See that this gravel bar is missing. But there is still gravel down here filling up. Okay, this is some of the, where I want to walk through some of the river changes. And so I haven't gotten to complete the entire bay down. You can see the Patterson Bridge is in here in all the photos. Um, and I need to finish rectifying. So basically when you do GIS, if you take old photos, like the old Forest Service photos or other over flyover photos, you have to geo-rectify them to all the maps so that they actually lay in the exact same place that they would um, in fact be. So I've got to do that still for the lower sections, but I do plan on making this available for anybody. And I have several more years than this as well, where we'll do the bay 
and then also the river to show the changes over time. This slide is important to me, and I'll go into it a little bit more, but uh, as humans, we all have memories of things, and I am a culprit of this every day of this wasn't the way I remembered it, or no, it was never like that, um, or I remember when I used to, you know, all these, all these statements, they're anecdotal, they're super important, they're part of our history, they're part of our written history and our oral history, but they may not also always reflect the truth on the ground. So having these uh, photos to help me remember the way things actually were versus even what I remember from 10 years ago or 12 years ago um, is important to me. And I think it's important to be able to transfer this information to other people um, as well. So like I said, stick with me. I'm going to make these maps available to everybody too so you can share them in any way you like as well. But this is the 2016 photo. So this is the latest uh, base layer map that is available. A new one just came out like three weeks ago, so I don't have that one. But so the red outline is the 25th, or sorry, the 2016 outline of the river. And so what you want to follow is going back in time. So this is 2005. The red outline again is what the river looks like today, now. Um, and the yellow is now following where the river was in 2005. So it's pretty similar, but you can see that now this is open, this is chewed off a bit. This is all fairly similar. You get to 1980, I don't have the river outline, but you can see that the river is right here. You see where the 2016 river is? It's amazing. It's going over this entire landmass, and it's even more obvious here. This, this, this land is not here anymore. Yes, sir? Are we looking at similar tides? Uh, that's an interesting one. I don't know from some of the really old photos. The 39, I don't know, and the 69, I don't know. They are on the 80, the 15, and the, or sorry, the 5 and the 16. And I do have some from 70s and 60s as well that are, that you can either say that's at a low tide or that's at a high tide. So there is a difference. How far does the tidal, how far is the tidal reach of the ocean? In the Rogue, it's very short. It's only about three miles. So it's a really high gradient river. Um, pretty much the entire river it loses about 3.7 feet per river mile the whole way. So it's pretty high gradient. Um, and it doesn't get a chance to push that salt up very high. So it's just kind of up past the mill bar, if you're familiar with that down in, down in the area. So it's pretty short. And this is, um, so it's just above here, basically, is where the title ends. And like I said, I want to finish the bay section too. But it's just important to remember that these areas, like this little little white dot here, is where I'm doing a project next summer. That wasn't even land before. <clears throat> because they did actually put some dredge spoils here when they put in the jetties. And then again, here's the 39. So um, the river is now running more northerly than it was southerly as it used to. So this is the interesting thing about a road. There's a lot of people who live in the Rogue, and the Rogue means a lot of things to a lot of different people. So to a lot of people, it means fish, fish only, salmon, salmon, salmon. Um, in fact, I'm from Missouri, I'm not from here, and so um, you may lose confidence right now. <laughs> but when I got here, I'm a fish biologist, and so when I got here, I was asking about all sorts of things, and the only thing I heard about was salmon, and it was like the only thing that anyone cared about, and I understand it, but there are a lot of amazing fish and aquatic organisms and marine fish that are involved in the rogue that are basically unheard of. So um, to me, the rogue does mean fish, but not just salmon. Uh, it means people. There's a lot of people on this river, and we're all spread out. There's a huge population center in Medford and Grants Pass, of which uh, we are downstream of. And so thank God for the wilderness area. It's a pretty amazing dilution area. Um, Boating, it, road means boating to me. I was just rafting last weekend on a Thursday to Sunday trip, and it was gorgeous. Ran lots of people catching uh, half pound steelhead and big steelhead and a couple of fall chinook too. So it's it's been an exciting time on the river, even though it's slow. Um, wilderness <clears throat> means wilderness to a lot of people I know. The things on the right now that we're getting to is some things that I feel like have come up a little bit over time. They've probably been present throughout time, but now that there's more people, we have more access to information, people are very aware of fires. 
Fires have been a big thing in the Rogue over the last few years. How are we going to deal with this? Um, sometimes when people think of the Rogue, they think of fires. Water. There's water issues. There's water quantity problems. There's all the things associated with water quantity and quality now. The dam removals, um, you know, still leaving some dams in, needing irrigation waters. There's a lot of conflict use with water on the Rogue. Um, farms. There's a few farms in here. There's some ranches here and there's some down here in the Rogue. Uh, there's several upstream. Um, there's also industry. There's gravel operation here. There's gravel operation here. Um, so there's, there's lots of uses in the Rogue. And then there's conflict because of all those uses. So again, I'm going to say there's all of our people uses and what we want to see, but there's a lot of other animals, wildlife, mammals, creatures, fish, you know, that have other uses of the river that we don't always acknowledge. It's um, a bit human-centric as we are. <laughs> so with that conflict and with user conflict and they started seeing loss of um, water, mostly in the upper road too, in 1995, Oregon legislature then unanimously passed this bill that said, we're going to make watershed councils, we're going to make this grassroots thing happen because that's how Oregon is. There's, this model is very different than many other states in the United States. Montana has some watershed councils. I think Minnesota has a few, but it's pretty limited um, to people that have this, and especially having dollars that are dedicated to watershed councils. Um, so this was originally in the Governor's Watershed Enhancement Board. Um, they were directed in 1995 to then direct the work of the councils. And this turned into OWEB, which is now the Oregon Watershed Enhancement Board. They provide technical assistance, they provide restoration dollars, um, and other kinds of um, aids for implementing the Oregon Plan for Salmon and Watersheds. So the Oregon Plan for Salmon and Watersheds had two motives when it first started. It's the Coastal Salmon Restoration Initiative and Healthy Streams Partnership. So those are the things that we're hitting on when we're getting these dollars. So if you'll notice the date, this is the cool thing right here. I said this happened in 1995. The Lower Rogue Watershed Council was one of the pilot projects in the state of Oregon. And so we were enacted by the county, by Curry County, in uh, May 16th of 1994. And so we came along before the legislature was actually even passed. And at that time, it was actually a group of people from all over Curry County, um, and which is now kind of different. We're now into the South Coast Watershed Council and Lower Rogue. We've split a little bit. But the really important thing about the Watershed Council is that I would say it's not on this list, but the first thing that we are is we're not regulatory. So we're definitely someone who is out there to help you or to assist you or to give you information without putting you at risk of um, getting in trouble with an agency or something like that. We would much rather come across and help before it, anything gets elevated to that point. <coughs> so we do try to represent the local knowledge. And we do have ties to all the existing um, community and all the complexities within those communities. As we know, like a lot of things don't happen unless the people that are on the ground understand what's happening and can get together and come together to do things. Um, so we do work across all jurisdictions too. We work with agencies, we work with people of all political spectrums, and we want to look at the watershed in a really holistic way. We all want something different from the watershed, and I think it can happen together if we can all really be considerate of our choices. Uh, we are a forum to bring local and state and federal land management agencies together. So a lot of times, too, we do sit at the table and we bring the BLM in, we bring the Forest Service in, or ODFW, um, NOAA. I mean, there's several agencies that will come to the table and they come to us because they know that our groups represent a wide variety of people. That being said, I mean, the, the chair of my watershed council is um, Ron Ray. He's the forester for Rainier Timber. So the chair of my watershed council is a timber industry guy. And it's amazing. And so far he's been there since I've been here, which has you know, been seven and a half years now, and he's been here longer than that. And he's always finding ways to help us with restoration projects. And we do really symbiotic things. So um, we all know roads are a problem a lot of times with sediment um, inputs into systems. And you know, timber industry, they have a lot of roads. And so they're not always uh, well done or they might need an update on a drainage or a new bridge or a fish passage culvert something like that so we've worked on projects together where they'll provide large wood for the stream and then we do like an in-stream restoration project while we're um, 
reducing the inputs from poor water quality from road systems. So it's, it's, that's the type of thing, if you can sit down and help each other in the same way, that it works out. <clears throat> and it gives local people a voice in natural resource management. I feel like there's all these plans that happen all the time too. They come to you, oh now this plan's happening, you have to do this. A lot of times the Watershed Council can kind of like get ahead of that game. So if we can help you to make changes on your property before they're coming down to you in a mandated way, that's a much more better way to approach it, we think, too. So our purpose is to protect, enhance, and restore long-term natural resources and economic stability of the Lower Rogue and the Near Shore. We added the Near Shore a few years back because we had a marine biologist um, that was on our board, and she was emphasizing how important that connection between the estuary and the Near Shore is for fisheries, also for aquatic plants and organisms. And so she brought a new lens to us as well, and uh, we really, really appreciate that. There's a lot of... Um, fish that are using the estuary and traveling around the near shore, using all the coastal estuaries in the county and beyond. So I'll get off my soapbox of the council here in just a little bit, but these are things I really believe in, um, not only personally, but also at the council level as a coordinator. And these are things that I really try to get the board members to understand too, that, that this, this, these are our values and these are very strong and these go over many boundaries. So we do believe that a healthy environment and a healthy economy are inextricably, inextricably linked. Like I, we fully believe that. I think that's the only way, even in the world moving forward, that this is gonna work out. We're watching it fail right now, so. <coughs> we believe that watershed stewardship should be based on a combination of sound science, education, and community involvement. We believe that a strong stewardship ethic enables us to live healthy natural resource, leave healthy natural resources for future generations. I have two little kids, so I have a lot of concern for that. Um, we value our relationship with landowners who have voluntarily joined in full watershed habitat restoration. This is really, really another point, important point. Nothing we do happens without our relationships and our reputation in this community and in these communities. All the projects that we do are based on voluntary landowner input. So um, rarely are we just approaching people to say, hey, can I do this on your property? Hey, can we do this? Unless it is, um, lately I've done that a little more with the estuary because it's a little bit more um, one for all in the estuary. There's a lot of people and um, in fact, the whole entire road basin relies on the estuary. So it is a really important spot. But basically, it's just um, somebody comes to us and says, you know, hey, I got this issue. We've had people come and say, hey, my neighbor has this issue. She's elderly. Can you go talk? You know, or, you know, so we don't, if somebody says no, we walk right away. That's it. You come to us if you want to talk to us. If you don't, that's fine. Um, and then all the work that we do um, also is grant funded. So it's really important that a landowner is invested in the project that we're planning on doing on their property. They have to put some skin in the game whether that's an in-kind, like I'll help run equipment, I'll buy trees, I'll plant some stuff, or it's cash. Um, but so basically, it only works if the person really wants to see the project go. So we really tried to make <clears throat> This has been an important turn over the last few years. The Lower Rogue Watershed Council, we've always been housed with the Curry County Soil and Water Conservation District. They were enacted in the 50s. Um, following Dust Bowl and all this sort of stuff. Um, but so now we collectively call ourselves the Curry Watersheds Partnership. So that's the Lower Road Watershed Council, the South Coast Watershed Council, the Curry Soil and Water Conservation District, and we have a nonprofit arm that we call the Curry Watersheds Nonprofit. And that came about a few years back because we needed to be able to accept foundation dollars as well for a lot of the projects that we do. And the district is the fiscal agent, so they're a special district, like a port or a school, um, or anything out like that. So they do have some restrictions around um, their money. So that's why we did the 501c3. Um, they're all non-regulatory and we share 13 staff. So it's enabled us to be a much more beefed up organization than we would be all separately. Um, and we generally, you know, put around a million dollars in and a million dollars out of the organization um, every year. 
So our main three goals are to conserve and restore natural processes, promote watershed education and stewardship, and then again to support the economic stability of the rogue. Again, this is very linked. Without a healthy river, we do not have a healthy community, hands down. Um, and that last little quote I just like because I felt it's very appropriate. Um, sometimes people say, why the rogue or why does it matter? Or, you know, you can think of your salmon as everyone's salmon. They're, co they're, they're coastal, they're all moving around. So as salmon populations in other rivers in the Pacific Northwest decline, it's really important and imperative that the rogue river health is increasing and being better to support other populations that aren't getting the love that the rogue river can get. Um, really highly valuable habitat for those fish and people. This is some few rogue basin facts. Uh, so the whole rogue basin is 3.3 million acres and that flows about 215 miles um, from the, anyone know? Headwaters. Crater Lake, yep, headwaters. The headwaters are in Crater Lake, right around Crater Lake um, to the Pacific Ocean. It drains about six counties. That's a something else that nobody ever thinks about, how spread that river is. It drains a lot of counties. Um, there's a population of close to 300,000 at this point um, in the entire watershed. Um, and the other interesting part is most of our watershed is forested. It's a lot of timber production, um, among other things. So about 70% is forested, 22% grassland, and 4% agriculture. So <clears throat> hence our pass of, of timber you know, it's kind of what you got. You do what you got, so. Great part about the Rogue is that 58% of the Rogue is actually designated as National Wild and Scenic River. Amazing. We have five in our area, it's amazing. Um, so the Lower Rogue River, we have the mouth up to about River Mile 55. If you're familiar with um, Mule Creek Canyon inside the Scenic uh, Rogue or Kelsey Creek is just above that. Kelsey Creek's actually our cutoff, which is right near the Josephine County line. We used to do it all by county lines back in the day, and then we finally recognized that you know your watershed doesn't just stop at a county line, so we did include the whole Kelsey Creek watershed as well. Uh, the Lower Rogue was also one of the pilot projects for the National Wild Scenic River Program that was um, created by the Forest Service. And we just had our 50th anniversary last year for the Rogue, so that's got a portion of that in the Lower Rogue. Uh, we also look out for the Illinois River. It's farther over here from the folks that do the, there is an Illinois River Watershed Council and a conservation district there at a Cape Junction. Um, but we go up to about River Mile 7 on the Illinois River. And we're about 26,000 acres in the Lower Rogue. So not huge, but a lot of area. And lucky for me, most of it is already sort of self-managing in the, you know, kind of Lobster Creek up is, is pretty pristine. So uh, most of the work does occur around town and from sort of the 13 miles down. Now, the interesting part is the whole Rogue River is 3.3 million acres, but our estuary is just 1,880 square meters. It's tiny. It's so tiny now. Even for the size of it before it was modified, it was still pretty small. Um, and that is because of its high gradient. It just doesn't have room to spread. I mean, if you think about the coos or the coquille, the way all the fingers spread, it's really low gradient, has a lot of floodplain connectivity. Not so. <clears throat> in the Rogue. How could you tell a story about the Rogue River without talking about dams? Um, there are lots of them. There are still lots of them. The Rogue Basin Partnership is building um, a pretty large program right now where they've gone through and prioritized all those small dams and the old ones that aren't being used anymore, old copper dams and things like that. Interestingly enough, now they're historical items, so they have to be like culturally reviewed and all these sort of things. So, uh, But this is just quickly the Gold Hill Dam. I cannot find a date for when that came up. I searched so much for where it is that I don't know, but it came down in 2008. Uh, Savage Rapids Dam went up in 1921. And it came down in 2009. There's been a lot of work on the road lately. Uh, Goldberry Dam was actually a log structure built in 1904. And then uh, Brothers Ray came and bought it um, in 1941 and put up a full structure. And then they removed Goldberry Dam in 2010. The William Jess Dam, which you might all more lovingly know as the Lost Creek Dam, that's the big one on the road. That won't be coming out anytime soon. So that's really important 
Um, if you were here for 1964 or remember <laughs> that time that that dam was just built primarily for flood control and also for irrigation and uh, water storage. So it's there. And then the Elk Creek Dam uh, did not ever get finished, but it was constructed partially in 1980. Um, and then they finally removed all that piece in 2008. So those are all the large main stem dams. Um, so now the Rogue River actually flows about 157 free flowing miles in the Rogue River until you get to Lost Creek. So a lot of habitat um, opened up. A lot of those dams really um, hurt the spring salmon population. They primarily spawn upstream. Um, and so that's been one of the things that should hopefully help to recover, recover those. But there was a lot of habitat that was taken out of operation when those dams were in. So spawning is not necessarily our limiting factor. If you can think about it that way, we've opened up quite a bit of habitat these days. All these fish are um, the native fish of the Rogue River. So this is, there's coho salmon, Chinook salmon, steelhead, which some people call rainbow trout, uh, coastal cutthroat trout, there's resident cutthroat trout, Pacific lamprey. We have three kinds of sculpin. Um, there's so many sculpin. There's coast range and prickly and reticulate. There's several in all the other watersheds. Pistol River has a ridiculous amount of diversity of sculpins. If you're ever snorkeling there, it's amazing. Uh, we have the clam of small scale sucker, three spine stickleback, speckled dace, uh, white sturgeon, and green sturgeon. Uh, primarily green sturgeon, there's very few white sturgeon. This is a picture of the Illinois, and this is Indigo Creek coming into it. Beautiful river, hard to access. So I'm talking about salmon a lot because it is a big value of a lot of people that live here. I'm going to talk a little bit more about other values in a minute. But there was a study done <coughs> excuse me, a few years back that really tried to dig in and find the economic value of salmon to the rogue specifically. How much money is it bringing to our community? So that was a big peer-reviewed scientific study. It involved surveys. It also involved a lot of uh, literature review and uh, some on-the-ground work, too. What they found was there was about one and a half million dollars that was associated with commercial fishing, which I found really interesting since we're not a big port there at all. Um, 16 million annually associated with sport fishing. So that's all the people that are in the bay, upriver, drift boats, guides, all those guys heading down through the wild and scenic on their trips. But 1.5 billion associated with non-use values. So what that means is those are the people that are not actually fishing at all. Those are the hikers, you know, those are the bird watchers, those are the people that come watch the people in the bay, those are the people that come here to enjoy the beaches, the area. It's all still sort of uh, equated to the value because of the salmon habitat and because of the importance of the river. And so this, they came from that study that basically Oregonians are willing to invest in habitat restoration. I think it comes to something like $34 a household they were willing to put in, which came up to like $70 million a year that Oregonians are dedicated solely to putting in, like continually stating that they were happy to put this money into habitat restoration. <coughs> How important it, important it is to our communities. Are these dollar values for just the rogue? Just the rogue, only rogue. But it's all of the rogue. All of the rogue. Yes. So. Yeah. And not just the lower rogue. Yeah. <coughs> the whole entire rogue. Yeah. And uh, again, I can send you the study if you wanted to. I got the paper. If you want to read, it's really interesting. It would paper. be if I had time. I, I know. Numbers. <laughs> I know. And graphs. <laughs> Before you go to bed. It doesn't even have that many graphs, and I'm like, couldn't we put a few more pictures of this thing? <laughs> Um, so that's why we, you know, this is a really fun picture. This is an old one. Uh, this is like looking from the Wedderburn side over to Gold Beach. This is basically kind of where the Coast Guard station is now. So these are guys lined up fishing without boats. And this is behind here, what they call a hog line, where they used to just tie all their boats together all the way across the river when the sand would come in and just snag the heck out of them. <laughs> so that also is not a very sustainable way of catching fish, <laughs> as we found out. So 
we do say things like protecting the salmon habitat improves the quality of other recreational activities. It isn't just about fish, but salmon's kind of the driver for why people are here and why people do come to recreate um, a lot of times. Um, so fishing, boating, it's enhancing the economic value of our natural resources. If we're enhancing areas for fish, and we're also enhancing areas where people can go and view fish and people can see the health of the river increasing, then they want to be here too. I mean, Al hikes along the Rogue River constantly because it's amazing. He's made a, an awesome trail. He's going to talk about it next week probably. Um, from the mill all the way up to Lobster Creek. That's amazing, along with the help of several people um, to just be right on the river enjoying it. So, where are we at now? The Watershed Council, we kind of switch our initiatives every biennium or so, so we get, we get a new grant, we have to write a work plan and uh, say what we hope we can accomplish over the next two years. And then uh, we also have a strategic plan that we follow that's sort of a 10-year you know, strategic plan. We have an estuary um, plan as well that we're following. Estuary restoration has been our focus for the last four years. It takes a long time to do. It takes big money to get things done. And it takes a lot of um, consensus, if you will, of people to get things done. So that's been our main, uh, our main driver lately. The other things we do, um, like our stream restoration and fish passage work, um, the good news is that we've done lots of fish passage work over the last 25 years, and we're almost done with it. I mean, we've pretty much replaced almost every crappy culvert <laughs> anywhere along the Rogue River to be either a bridge or a fish passage culvert, um, or to remove it all together. We just removed one this summer, which was so exciting. We, um, it's a virtual ditch. Um, and then we started trapping for salmon in it, and we caught about 60 coho in three days. And we thought, ooh, ooh. And it was just some farmer that had said, oh, you know, I just want to get my equipment across. And he'd slam some tiny culvert in there. And he had no idea once we told him about the fish that were down there and the diversity that was in there. He says beavers and herons and night herons and all sorts of things in there. And he said, oh, I feel so bad for putting that in there. And so he didn't know any better. And he let us take it out last summer. So we didn't even put anything else in it. So now it's a big open wetland area um, that supports a lot of fish in the estuary. And uh, water quality and quantity, this is another thing we're doing. Um, a lot of, we do some stream temperature testing in the summer. Um, and uh, quantity, we're kind of trying to get in a hold on that. The thing we're approaching with quantity is just increasing uh, floodplain and floodplain connectivity. Because the more your land can hold water, the better off you are. We do a lot with invasive species, um, and so that's been a lot of our time and a lot of our grant monies goes out to fight against that, which can feel futile at times. What are the invasive? Uh, there's a lot of them. The big ones here right now are gorse and jubata grass are the big ones they're fighting right now, which people know as pampas grass. Mm -hmm. pampas grass. Yeah. Um, but we do a lot of English ivy work. There's tons of English ivy. Blackberry was like always our standard forever, and now blackberry seems like, yeah, it's not so bad. <laughs> uh, it's bad, but you know, there's just so many other bigger things to, to tackle too, but we generally um, will hit an area and clear everything that's not supposed to be there. Yellow flag iris, there's, there's a whole list um, that I know my weed manager would love to get into. Yeah. And then we do a lot of outreach and education as well. So just to walk you through a little bit of what this is, uh, this is uh, an area called God Wants You Slew down in Gold Beach. It's just downstream of Freeman Rock, um, who's a gravel operator there. They've been an amazing partner. Um, again, one of those symbiotic relationships where they say, do you need our equipment? Do you want to stage things in our, in our area? Can we help? Um, and have given us uh, full, full orders to do whatever we need to in there. So we're in working now with the design team that's uh, creating a bunch of large wood structures and some sloping of the banks to increase the floodplain connectivity that I was talking about. Um, and this is a natural little beaver dam that's been in there too for the last few years, so that's helping with water quantity in the Rogue River, um, sort of addressing those, the rearing habitat, that's the places for the little baby fish to grow. And that's what we're lacking in the Rogue. <coughs> so we're lacking in a lot of our rivers. It's the bottleneck, if you will. Um, I will say too, I've been talking a lot about fish, but we do do wildlife work as well. Um, to an extent that it helps. There's some projects down in Gold Beach too, like up on Kimball Hill, 
where we've done some uh, oak restoration, meadow restoration, and so they've had a lot of encroachment on some of these high meadows, and so we've been removing all those dug fur that are encroaching those areas to sort of help with um, elk habitat, you know, coyote you have all those sort of things that are in there. There's a lot of birds of prey that live in their meadows um, up there as well. And so we've done some pretty big work of increasing meadow size up on Kimball Hill lately too. So that's something we're kind of dipping our toes into as we think about whole watersheds. Sediment reduction and riparian habitat is another thing that we really focus on. Um, this is an area um, down in Gold Beach where we saw the bank is just uh, failing. So it's just, there's a difference between acute and like constant input of sediment. I mean, we have a lot, you know, with the fires and things too, you're going to get that. It's going to go, it's going to go away at some point. It's like, you know, where you have this like an acute event where it's just going to come down and you'll see it, you'll see landslide events. We have a really unstable geology in this area, so it really lends itself to that. But then you have these chronic inputs where it is like, you know, it's just like you just see it chewing away, chewing away, chewing away. And uh, set important, you know, there's an amount of sediment in creeks that's really important to creeks. It feeds all the little bugs, you know, in the interstitial spaces which feed the salmon. But then too much is too much. So this was an area where we saw this just over several winters, chew, chew, chew. So what we did was we basically excavated like all the way back here. There's about 40 trees in here. And they pile all the trees in with wood, rock, and gravel, covered it back up, and then heavily planted it. And so now we've seen that stop, which has been great. And that's a private landowner. That's just a grant that we wrote to do to them. They, I think, paid $200 of a match, and then they also provided in-kind work to fix their bank stabilization problem. So these are things, you know, if you see people or know people or you are those people, be thinking about it, you know, if you need assistance too. This is what we're here for. Uh, noxious weeds, I talked about that too. This is a big English ivy section. It was, these trees have already been cleared, but there were several trees that had ivy all the way up. This is just above the Shasta Costa River where it meets the Rogue. Um, and so we came in and spent two winters hands and knees, rolling the ivy, getting all the roots out. It's a tedious task, but it's totally worth it. Um, and, and if you don't want to spray, we do have uh, that option at our office too. We do have an herbicide applicator. Um, not everybody wants to do that. So we did that. Um, and then we were able to just buy a $20 permit from the Forest Service to transplant because they're surrounded by Forest Service property. All the plants are already zoned to their area. So we just went out and collected azalea, rhododendron, ferns, huckleberry, and then replanted the area as it should be. Um, and so now it's thriving. There's not the ivy in the trees. They're not going to lose all their trees down the hill. And then the Shasta Costa will still have proper shading. So that's basically the threat of the ivy is once it gets in the trees, it takes the trees down, then you lose all your shade on the stream. And you're holding in all your soil on your steep hills. Outreach education is a really big thing that we do. It's things like this is something we've been trying to do more of is like going out and talking to people and drumming up excitement about what we do or trying to get people involved. We also do a lot of uh, community events. <clears throat> One of our big ones is the Rogue River Cleanup that we do every year. And we generally have over 100 people every year. There's always half of those are kids. It's so much fun. Uh, and we go from the river mouth, we do the beaches as well, all the way up to um, Quisatina. And then we clean trash off the gravel bars. And so all these little kids pop off and you know have games of who collects the most tires or the most trash. And we've managed to plumb mill near fill a 20 cubic yard dumpster like every year. It's crazy. Like just so many things and washers and tires and I mean think about the whole road basin so. Um, and we serve everybody a free barbecue lunch for participating. That's my turn. And hugs from Smokey. Yeah, you get hugs from Smokey if you're willing to I mean a lot of the kids are like, ooh, they've gone to like, do you want to high five Smokey? So my kid did not like it the first year. Now she's into it. Like she knows she knows Smokey now. Um, let's see here. Okay, and this is my favorite part because I'm a biologist. This is the monitoring. So um, a lot of what we do too is monitoring. We do baseline monitoring. We do project effectiveness monitoring. Um, we looked at, we don't really have trend monitoring. We do have a lot of data, um, but we do roads, we do fish, we do water. Um, and so this is a pile of coho from that stream I was talking about earlier. Those are the guys that are smolting up and heading out to the ocean. So they were 
heading out. They're on their way to the ocean, just about four miles up still from the estuary. This is the Shasta Costa watershed, and this is the water thermometers that we put in here. So we have gotten smart about this and have gone to putting in, they call those hobos. And you can plot those in the water and they take water temperature continuously for six months or more at a time, like every 30 minutes. So you can really watch some cool stuff happen with diurnal changes and with storm events and things like that. So we've got a lot of really good data on Shasta Costa and several other watersheds too in the road, but the Forest Service has been monitoring Shasta Costa for a long time. And there's been a lot of um, different inputs into that watershed. <coughs> And the other one is me and my daughter at a fish trap also um, checking. The same fish trap that had these coho also had green-eared sunfish in it, which do not belong in the Rogue River. <laughs> I was blown away when I saw those. Being from Missouri, I was like, oh, a bluegill. <laughs> and I was like, oh, no, it's not a bluegill. <laughs> what? Wait, what? <laughs> Warm water fish. But um, Steve Major at ODFW said they inevitably show up somewhere in the watershed you know, over time. I caught a striped bass in the Rogue the first year I moved here. And I thought, no. Nah what's going on here um, so this is something we can do too and this is something we've also combined with um, outreach education as far as citizen science we used to do a storm chasers program which we're trying to get started again right now and it would be to have everyone go out during the first flush of the season like 70 volunteers and collect from every single like a little tributary and watershed, we have them collect turbidity, so how much dirt's in the water, and E. coli sample. So a lot of times you see high, you know, high volumes of E. coli in a first flush too. Um, so we've tracked that, we've done that for several years over time. We didn't have funding to do it over the last few years, but we're coming, we're gonna come back to that. So I might be calling you guys if you put your name somewhere. Um, again, I like to remind people that this, you know, the salmon are using the streams, the rivers, the estuary, the ocean, but it's not only salmon, it's migratory birds. We're on the flyover. Um, it's starry flounders, it's green sturgeon, it's great white sharks are in our estuary sometimes. There's lots of things happening out there. And so these are the points I was trying to make a little bit earlier about returning. I appreciate it, this was from Dan Bottom, he works for NOAA. He never talks about returning salmon to rivers. He always says returning rivers to salmon, which I really enjoy that play on words. Um, but what he talks about it a lot is life history patterns and how we're losing that. So life history is just like your, where you fit at in the cycle. So we used to have a lot of different life histories of fish. There were fish that moved at a lot of different times of the year. And then you start restricting them and restricting their water input, and restricting their times. And so then you kind of come down to like, oh, now only this one works. So he was saying the best thing we can do is to get, increase the diversity, increase the amount of habitat available to keep increasing those life history or at least return them the life history diversity. <clears throat> that's probably gonna be the one thing that's going to save us as far as salmon goes. So the things we're doing now, this is the Rogue River also. This is the area, one area of our project is right up in here. Um, and then the other one is right down in here. We're doing a wetland project in the estuary. We're expanding um, a wetland on the Knox's property. It's right across from Indian Creek Cafe, if you've ever eaten out there. Um, it's, there's very few areas in the Rogue River where we even have the opportunity to increase the amount of habitat. And so we've generally only been focused on quality. These two areas, the two landowners, Freeman and Knox, have both allowed us to actually increase quantity by excavating as well. So that's really exciting because those limiting factors are up there right now. That's that reduced, those shallow water habitats, that backwater habitat, that slow water, that's where all the babies are. It's like we've virtually ripped out all of our nurseries. You can't have babies if you don't raise them. And when the river is kind of turned into this just shoot, you know, there's just no, it's like living in a hallway. Who wants to live in a hallway? I don't want to. Um, so, and then there's loss of the connectivity between the habitats, and there's loss of access to off-channel habitats. So that's what I was talking about earlier too with the floodplain connection. The, the more intact that the river is with its floodplain, and this stuff happens naturally. People move in, um, obviously, you don't want your land to flood. I mean, if you have property there, or you're ranching, or you're um, working, or you have some other um, uses for your land. So this is why, over time, people have fortified it or hardened, you know, the river's edges. But that's not doing anybody any favors. And there's been a lot of people that are open to, to removing those areas now. But when you lose that floodplain connection, that's you're losing your water quantity, and you're losing your habitat. So we're working on that. 
that's our focus. And that's actually the focus of several people, um, several rivers here. The South Coast Watershed Council is also working on that. We're working in the Sixes River um, coming up soon too. And there's some work um, in Elk. So how can you guys get involved? Um, Big thing, donations, I mentioned earlier, we, we only um, are grant funded, so my job is grant funded. All the projects we do are grant funded. You have to write a grant for everything that we do. Um, nothing happens without that. Um, so we are always accepting donations. We are not a taxing district. The Soil and Water District is not a taxing district. Um, assisting at volunteer events, board service is always a fun one. I know everybody in here is probably actually on like six boards already. I don't doubt it. Um, Sharing the story with others. So, like I said, if you have a neighbor that has a noxious weed problem or a bank stabilization problem or something else, um, you know, let us know. Or if they're just interested in enhancing the area they have. We have people that come and say, how, yeah, you know, could this be better? Um, so just pointing us to opportunities. Uh, I put my email at the bottom here um, if you want it. If you need, like, weed issues, you can do info or me. And then we have a website, furrywatersheds.org. And then that's the sea line from the bay. <laughs> Any questions? What is the um, salmon? I mean, it's not the only thing, but if the salmon are healthy, other things are probably Absolutely. healthy too. Yeah. So, what is it like right now versus 20 years ago and 40? You know, is it getting better? Because uh, I just hear doomsday stories. Uh, yeah. I hear that, you know, all like in Brookings, the crab industry, and we've only lived here three and a half years, but it sounds like everything's going down. Mm -hmm. And there's more fishing here. You made that comment. Mm -hmm. A fisherman told me that actually Brookings is a pretty decent sized port mm -hmm. for the whole, you know, sure. Northwest coast. Yeah, it's bigger than. It's an, it's an important port. It's definitely more important than than Gold Beach's port, probably for as far as ocean access and fishing access to the ocean. I mean, Gold Beach is pretty unsafe, really. Many people die on the bar since I've been here. I mean, it's it's a inevitable thing. But What's so unsafe because it, it has a bar. Uh, so each year, that's why the uh, the Army Corps comes and dredges a uh, passage. It, it's you know mainly for Coast Guard for safety to get Coast Guard out and also for fishing access. But every year, like I was saying, the road closes up, so it builds up this bar. So it starts to build a bar across the mouth of the road. So as you, if you don't know what you're doing or you don't cross it at a right tide or a right uh -huh. time or the swell's too much, it can flip your boat in no time, or you can run aground. <clears throat> it's usually what happens. <laughs> but as far as, I don't know, I'm a super optimist, so I have a really hard time and I'm thinking about everything as doomsday. It feels that way for me right now, like just in the political world of the world right now. But I feel like, I feel like it's not as bad as we say it is. Like I, I, think, I think the ocean is going to be a struggle. I think we are doing everything we can in the river and on our freshwater systems, but the truth of the fact is a lot of these fish don't survive without good ocean conditions. And so I think we will see that continuing to decline until we can worldwide come across some strategies that are better than what we're doing. Um, but, you know, as far as the fisheries, like, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of gone and come and gone and come, so I don't, I can't specifically speak to it over, you know, I'm 40, so I can only talk about the last maybe 20 years of that I've recognized there's been issues, but it's, it's been, you know, the 80s had a huge decline. We saw tons of overfishing in the oceans and in the freshwater in the 80s, too. It happened in the early 1900s. You know, we made all these actions, and then we kind of come back. When I first moved here, we had a huge, huge salmon boom. Like, and the fishing was amazing in the early 2000s. It was awesome. It's back down a little bit again. But even this year, as far as the rogue's concerned, Fall Chinook are a little low compared to the 10-year average, but the steelhead, the half-pounders, um, coho are still a little bit above the 10-year average for this year. So it's just, it's cyclical. It's hard to determine where all the noise is, I feel like, mm -hmm. when you're looking at it, because there's so much involved with it. It's like, where's the one point in your life that made you do this one? You know, there's so many, so many inputs. 
And I'm from Kansas and farmers back here. It's always a bad, you know, they're always complaining. When, when it's good, yeah. not so much. So it's kind of the same thing with fishermen. Oh, it, totally. Yeah. Always, I mean, yeah, yeah they don't I say, love fishermen. I like to fish, it's, but it's, yeah, it's always the, you know, if you're fishing only to catch, then I don't know that, you know, that's what fishing is. You don't always nail fish, and it's not always there for you. And I feel like the fact is, like, you know, it's been really slow some years, and then they go out and they complain about it, be, not fishermen specifically, but people are like, oh, it's slow, or even people in town, businesses, you know, there's not as many people here, or, you know, but two years ago, or last year, when it was crazy, everybody's complaining because there's too many people in the bay, you know, there's 100 boats in the bay, and it's too much, and everybody's running into each other, and so it's, it's a little bit of the, like, you don't, and grass is always greener, I feel like, that's my personal opinion, yeah, Doug. What's the life cycle on these major fish, the salmon, the steelhead, and so forth? And it is, are these changes to the estuary, I mean, they're talking about it kind of being uh, clogged up with, with gravel. Yeah. Could that actually be a good thing for five years down the road? Yeah. Be, you know, and, and could the really bad this year be because it was a really good year five yeah. years ago? Absolutely. That's the other thing to remember about salmon like you're really what you're looking at now is not a snapshot of now it's basically a snapshot of four years ago or whenever the five years ago it depends on when that cohort comes back they typically spend three to four years in the ocean jacks sometimes come back after a year those are your really young vigorous salmon that are in there to steal it and go and they'll go back out again <laughs> but generally they're you know three four years come back in so you're sort of seeing the results of what the fit you know how many fish went out four years ago. I'm actually concerned what will happen this year because we had uh, late, you know, like all the fish were sort of spawning in the main stem. And then we had this huge, we had the huge water in February and April, right when those fish should be coming out, the alley vendor coming out of the gravel. So it's like, well, I don't know what's gonna happen in four years from now. How many of those fish survive during those flood events when they're just popping out of the gravel? So it's sort of that, like, and I don't know how many fish are in there. And so, you know, Speaking to the gravel in the bay, I would like to say that I feel like um, sometimes two people look at the gravel and they just see it as a problem. I think they see it as like trash out there. It's like, oh, it's just a bunch of gravel. But that gravel is like hugely important, hugely important for all those macro invertebrates. That's what feeds fish. That's what feeds birds. That's what feeds lampreys and you know all the marine species that are out there too. It's not like it's a desert out there. And from what I've been hearing from other biologists at ODFW is that the fish had no problem at all passing through the bay this year. <laughs> Boats have trouble passing through the bay, um, which can be um, an issue. And I don't want to be, you know, insensitive to people, but I've talked to some guides too, and I asked them if they're, you know, is your business failing because of this? No, they could book seven days a week. People don't come here and like never go fishing again because they didn't catch a fish. Like that's not the scenario. And that's what a lot of those people are out there. I mean, they're on a guide boat, so, you know, they're out there to enjoy the beauty and hopefully catch a salmon, but it doesn't always happen. So I would just caution people to not think that the <clears throat> plugging up is like a, that it's plugging up. I mean, you can walk across the road when I moved here. Everybody's like, oh, you can walk across it. It's like, you can always walk across parts of it at some point in some time. Like, it's how it is. It moves around, and there's been lots of studies. There's some USGS studies where the gravel bars are constantly moving vertically and laterally, and that's what they do. You'll see big bars some years and little bars some years. Doesn't mean that there's not enough habitat for salmon to get there. And if you've seen salmon in Never Watershed, they will be like, I mean, they're just like rubbing their bellies raw to get over things. They don't care. My, my question is the quality of the river. Yeah. I know Bear Creek goes into the road river. And it is it's just a polluted, yeah. You know, it's a polluted river. So, what is the quality of the river for the fish? How is that? Mm -hmm. um, I don't like. I don't have you know water water quality specifics on that. I do know from working with the Rogue River Watershed Council up there that they've been doing a lot of work in Bear Bear Creek, They're doing a lot of uh, awareness and education things. Um, we have done more testing here in the past, but we don't have that kind of staff on right now. Um, nutrient input and phosphorus and nitrogen, yeah. um, all those sort of things. We have yet to test for um, like pharmaceuticals or things like that. 
I think that's something that people are interested in and we should probably look at doing at some point. But as far as all the other parameters we've kind of looked at, and DEQ has a lot, uh, Department of Environmental Quality, you can go on um, to their website. They have ambient sampling for a lot of sites on the road and it's pretty clean, surprisingly enough, where we are. Like, I'm always amazed, but that's a, that's a lot of dilution in the middle. Yeah. So when he talks about pollution, what, what is pollution? Uh, to me, I, first things that come to mind is like sewage, gray water, pharmaceuticals, agricultural, agricultural runoff, um, those sort of things, I think is what, because those can have a big impact on fish. The little butte goes into the river, and it, it's funny, the first part of the winter, that is such a beautiful creek. Yeah. Towards the end of this farming season, it's not good to even go in it. Yeah. And it goes right in the road. Right. Yeah, and a lot of people have been um, doing some projects to help farmers. You know, we're kind of that cusp too, where a lot of the farmers are like aging out and they're, you know, their kids aren't taking over or they're switching to something else. And we do want to maintain that lifestyle. It's really important for our communities too to have agriculture. Sure. But what we're finding is that we can do it in more manageable ways. You know, and we can use less of more. There's a lot of new technologies out there that we've been installing here, even on cranberry farms, where it's all, I mean, these guys now are on their cell phones, like, oh, this is low, blah, 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 blah. I mean, it's kind of amazing, but that's where it's gone to a lot of places. And they're trying to do that in the road basin, too, where they can really limit the amount of chemical inputs that they're putting on, limit the amount of water they're using. Um, so I think just as we get better at it and we get neighbors transfer knowledge, or they get over the hump that, like, it's not so hard to do, that they could make some of those changes in the basin. Nice. Yeah, that's the hope. Yeah. What about the Jetco? Can I ask about that? <laughs> I, I don't know if I know anything about the Jetco. Okay, so you mentioned <laughs> testing <clears throat> Thank you. of uh, you know the turbidity and, yeah. and E. coli and stuff. Uh, I did wonder where you test for the E. coli. You you, you had mentioned where is it you do that on the Rogue? Is it down by the mouth? Or the road they do it at Lobster Creek Bridge. They, they, okay. We do it with the DEQ. Um, and so they do, most of their spots are bridge buckets. So they'll go off of a bridge um, to do that testing. So Lobster Creek is the rogue. On the Checo, it's the high bridge, right by Icebox. Some people call it Bikini Bridge. I don't know what the other, what the actual name of it is. Is it high bridge? Is that what they call is it? Is that up above low part? Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's... Um, Second bridge. It's what? Second bridge. Second bridge. Thank you. Yeah. So they, yes, do, they, they, they do those sample there. They do it every other uh, every other month, all year long. And if you go to their website, you can look at all the. They do a lot more parameters. They do nitrogen and phosphorus, uh, nutrients. Um, so they do test at all those locations. They do Pistol River also at the second bridge uh, behind there. They do it all throughout Curry County. Elk River has it as well. Check those amazing. And can you speak to the, the citizen science? I think I hear a, a lot about, actually, we've been talking about how to get college students. The high school, Same. they've got an environmental club. Mm -hmm. you know, how did they get involved in doing some things like testing that they could take water back to the classroom, right. maybe, and, and do some turbidity testing or mm -hmm. um, some other types of things? I think that would be great. I mean, there's there's some uh, relationships already out there. I mean, Surfrider works with the Port Orford High School to do uh, sampling of water too, and they collect all the samples, give it to the students, they take it to the lab and analyze it for them. So I think there's a model that we could use, because I would love to also get high school and college involvement in our Watershed Council, and I know the South Coast Watershed Council would certainly love to do that too. I think, um, being, uh, it's not as exciting, but even being like a board liaison too, to have input on those ideas as well would be a really great way to get involved and have some um, input on what actually goes on the ground. But I think also there's lots of ways that we could uh, organize days to do water quality sampling. There's, we do um, E. coli sampling. <coughs> Excuse me, I'm helping Nicole. We do um, E. coli sampling in the Rogue all summer long. And that's throughout the entire basin. Our spots are in the bay at Quisatina Campground and then at Cougar Lane and Agnes. So I have to do that. I would love to get someone else to actually go up and collect those samples and analyze them. We have a lab. So, you know, it's a volunteer project, <coughs> but it would be really great. Um, we provide the samples if someone else could actually do the work of it and then transfer the information. It's all online. 
people can go and see if the area they want to swim is safe. Mm -hmm. um, that's what it's for, basically. You can go and get the green light or the red light, so it's always green yeah. in the rug, <laughs> which is nice. But those are, yeah, those are a couple ideas I can think off the top of my head. Otherwise, there's always like tree planting opportunities and that sort of stuff that's, um, you know, we do a lot of on the ground work, weed removal, stuff like that, that's maybe not the most fun, uh, but very important part of what we do. Thanks, Doug. All right. Thank you guys so much for coming and spending your time tonight. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I just want to give you a, a compliment. It, all of these lectures I go to, you hear about this watershed group and that watershed group, and everybody's got, you know, Rogue and South Coast, and I get so confused about what they all do. Yeah. And so it's really. You know, your presentation, I feel like I at least know what, I'm still a little confused, you've got all these organizations. It's good we all do the same thing. <laughs> we just have different service areas. I mean, OWEB, OWEB, it's basically doled out on like spaces and money. You know, so it's like we each have a different watershed and that can't change by OWEB standards. So the South Coast service area is like everything but the road. They do the same project types. They have different priorities because of their watersheds. They'll have different priorities, but yeah, we all, <laughs> the district basically just handles a lot of the agricultural stuff. So we do the private landowner, both the councils, private landowner work, the outreach stuff, and then the district does like the agricultural work and works with the Natural Resource Conservation Service, um, those groups too, to like basically just ag lands. So, which is mostly north in this case. There, there's some down south that we also dabble in, but yeah. that's really interesting. But it's confusing. It confuses our own staff, so don't feel bad. <laughs> we are, we are a mixed up bunch that have been together for 25 years and we're still trying to clarify it.